Good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, an exciting program uh, with Meg Mott speaking uh, first on uh, free speech and its limitations and what it uh, covers, uh, followed by a screening of 1984, which if you haven't seen before is quite a treat, so please do stick around. And um, I hope we don't leave you too dark and dismal at the end of this, because <laughs> some of this material is pretty heavy, but uh, uh, thanks for coming out and enjoying anyways. Enjoy the Go, and thanks so much to Meg for All coming right. out. Thank you. Thank you, Tim Mikovits, and thank you to Vermont Humanities and to Northern Vermont University. And I gather um, we have people who are looking at this from elsewhere. This is being screened as well. But I appreciate uh, those of you who came out uh, tonight to be in this beautiful auditorium. I have never been here before, and I was stunned when I walked in. Uh, this is a deep, deep stage. It keeps going even further back than the scrim right there. And uh, beautiful acoustics. Anyway, so thank you for coming out. It's a little uh, wild for me because usually I'm giving this talk and I'm in my basement in Putney on a goat farm and I'm speaking to my laptop and in the newest version I can't even see who's there in the audience. So it's, it's a webinar format. And I've gotten used to, I don't know, my own private world where I imagine that there's people out there and everybody's nodding and excited and thinking, yeah, you're fantastic. Well, I can't see anybody. So I just pump it up in my head about how uh, enthusiastic this audience is that I can't imagine. So to actually have a few people here, I mean, this is not a bad turnout. I was told that there may only be like two or three people um, who might show up. So I really appreciate those who came out and I'm um, looking forward to a discussion. Um, and I also uh, want to acknowledge the fact that talking about free speech is always controversial. However, at this time on the planet, uh, I am feeling like it's even more important to be speaking about free speech. For me, a, a key indicator that a democracy is healthy is that it allows dissent. And free speech has always been there to protect the dissenters in the United States, except when it's not. So um, in the beginning of, of the talk, I'll, I'll just very briefly go through uh, the text of the First Amendment. And then because the text begins with Congress, Congress shall make no law, but how was that actually understood? Congress could not abridge freedom of speech, but it turns out others could. Uh, so a very brief little history uh, thinking about what the, t uh, what the actual text of the First Amendment is and then what it actually allowed, especially in the beginning. But starting with World War II, the Supreme Court began to understand freedom of speech in a very different way than they had in the beginning. It wasn't just a negative right, Congress shall make no law. It became robust, it became big, it became necessary. Uh, so we'll look at uh, two, one case from the World War II era and a notification from a second case. So we'll spend a little bit of time around World War II where the United States started to take freedom of speech as the central ingredient to have a democracy. And then in the 1990s, we'll look at another case that is uh, much more focused on hate speech. And, um, and at that point, we'll be able to answer this question, because this is a question of the evening, before we get to 1984. Must free speech endure hate speech? And uh, the answer is actually quite simple, and the Supreme Court will be able to tell us in one word. But I'll wait until they weigh in on this topic. So this question was posed in the 1990s, and the Supreme Court answered it definitively, unilaterally, unanimously. Um, but I also, uh, I believe enough in democracy that we're not gonna just leave it with the mighty justices, the guys in robes, the Supremes. I wanna then take us through the same question, must free speech endure hate speech, thinking about it on a much more democratic level, on a social level, less legal and more, uh, what does it mean to be a citizen in a free society and what do we need to do in order to be able to endure 
hate speech. I've been giving this talk for a number of years now, and it's only recently I began to see, and it was because of a comment uh, somebody made in a recent presentation, that the word endure uh, is actually super important. And so that's one of the things we'll talk about when we get off the Supreme Court um, and the textual constitutional language and into the feelings and the, the business of enduring. Okay, so here's, oh, it does work. Um, let's see if I can use this fancy machine. So here is the language, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So I see this as the life cycle of a citizen. We start with uh, a very personal, interior, semi-spiritual, very explicitly religious understanding that we get to determine for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. And through that process, through that conscience, moral inquiry, uh, we begin to decide what it is we feel is right and wrong, and we speak it, we say it, then we publish it, then we get others around us who may feel the same way, and eventually we are assembling, uh, whether in a protest movement or with a sign uh, quietly by ourselves in the town square, and then we are petitioning the government for a redress of grievances. So if, if it starts in this position, the First Amendment, it goes through this whole process, and then by the end, you can think of somebody with their hands up. Um, the, it's a, it's a, a way of being in the world where we first tune into ourselves, and then we can build a movement. Will this work? Yeah, okay. So I mentioned how, oh wait, let me go back one. Um, I said how the language here is so important. Congress shall make no law. The states always made laws abridging speech. In fact, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson were very explicit. They said, yeah, Congress can't make any law, but the states are going to um, abridge speech, abridge the press all the time. We can count on it. So it was not understood to be an absolute right in the beginning. Uh, and the other person who really did a terrible job in terms of the First Amendment, I have great respect for this president, but he was awful in terms of the First Amendment. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? See, now I can see people sort of in the darkness. Does anybody know which was the worst president when it came to free speech? Yes. Oh, interesting. John Adams, and why do you say that? Alien Sedition Act was not very good for free speech. Absolutely right. So John Adams is not looking so good. Uh, but there's another president who completely eradicated freedom of speech, freedom of press. Yes, the Alien and Sedition Act, if you said certain things were, were considered treasonous, you could end up in jail. In the back. Lincoln, yes, why? He didn't want anything, north or south, that said anything against the Civil War. Any complaint of the, civil, of the war he was waging, he was against. Uh, he even got rid of habeas corpus, which is like the, the very basic understanding of a free society. Habeas corpus is that the state puts you in jail, you get to do a writ of habeas, and that means that uh, bring the body forward. You should be able to find out why you were put in jail. Lincoln gets rid of that. Um, he does it only briefly. He has military reasons to do it, and then he goes back to life as good. But um, this idea that free speech is absolute uh, even the text doesn't give us that. But as I said, oops, sorry. In the 1940s, during World War II, a case went to the Supreme Court. And it comes out of West Virginia. And the Barnett family was a family of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they uh, protested. They did not want their children to do this Pledge of Allegiance. And that's what the pledge used to look like. It's not the way I learned to do the pledge. But in the 1940s, the, this was the pledge. And everybody who was in school had to do this pledge. Um, and when the Barnett children 
were, uh, refused to obey the pledge, they were thrown out of school. And then their parents were threatened with truancy. So it was fairly high consequences for not conforming with the West Virginia uh, school regulations. And Justice Robert Jackson took this case and he uh, decided in favor of the Jehovah Witness family, the Barnetts, and he makes this big claim for freedom. One's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, a free press, freedom of worship, and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome, they depend on the outcome of no elections. Turns out, with that language, no longer can any legislative body, we're not just talking Congress here, any deliberative body can vote out um, these sort of protections. So it becomes this idea of fundamental rights. Just because a majority gets into office does not mean that they can uh, abridge any of these rights that are listed in the First Amendment. So it takes on a whole other feeling than it had uh, prior to World War II. And there's one other statement that I grabbed from this, and this is a concurring opinion from Justice Frank Murphy. And I want us to really try and hold on to this one uh, because of this arc that we're taking in this presentation. This is going to be very important terms. It is in freedom of speech and the example of persuasion, not in force and compulsion, that the real unity of America lies. So when we're talking about freedom of speech, it's not just a negative right, if we're leaning on this language here. It is a permission an encouragement, almost a, I'm never going to say compulsion, because that would be totally against this. It is an invitation to engage in persuasion and not force and not compel, but to actually believe. That's a pretty big thing, that you can persuade somebody of your point of view and that they may try and persuade you and you can still focus on your own thoughts, focus on your moral conscience and decide for yourself. Uh, so that's the big case, um, this Barnett case. And there's some others around this time. But this language here is a strong statement in favor of persuasion and a strong statement against force or compulsion. And you could see how these school kids were being compelled. It wasn't that what they said was offensive. This is an example of compelled speech. Even for a noble cause, right? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, even during war, wartime. Uh, Murphy says you cannot compel uh, patriotism, and you should not compel speech. OK, so that's, let's see. Just, um, there's one other case, and it falls in this category, that even so, even if we have this broader statement for speech, for persuasion, and against compulsion, it, I don't want to make it sound like we have absolute, un, um, absolute speech protections. So there are a few categories that are considered unprotected speech. And I'm just going to focus on one. This is another one that comes out of a case. Uh, the case is Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, 1942. Uh, this is where another Jehovah's Witness, these are our great dissenters in this country. Another Jehovah's Witness is in Rochester, New Hampshire. And he thinks the war in Europe is terrible. And he is wanting to put out information on the streets to let people know that um, uh, this war is ill-advised. Uh, it The Americans should not be sent to Europe. And uh, he starts being told he has to be quiet. And people are gathering around. And next thing you know, a whole riot has started because here's this guy in the middle of Rochester, New Hampshire, saying, don't go to war. And uh, so he sues that it's a violation of his um, First Amendment rights because he's arrested. And this is what the court says. So even though the court, around the same time, makes a big statement where you cannot compel speech, you cannot force speech, free speech is all about persuasion, there are certain things called fighting words 
words which by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite an immediate breach of the peace. So hold on to this definition if you can. Which by their very utterance inflict injury. Sounds like hate speech. So we could make the case because of the fighting words doctrine. Hate speech, which is intended to inflict injury, uh, should not be protected speech. So that's kind of where we are uh, around the Second World War. So let's jump up in time to this case here, 1992. It's uh, called RAV versus City of St. Paul. RAV is a juvenile. Whenever a case is just the people's initial, not the full name. It's because they're protected as juveniles, uh, unless they self-disclose. I still don't know who RAV is. Uh, but the question before the Supreme Court was, does an anti-bias ordinance violate the First Amendment right to free speech? Because the city of St. Paul passed an ordinance, an ordinance that says, Whoever places on public or private property a symbol or object, such as a burning cross or Nazi swastika, which one knows or has reasonable grounds to know, arouses anger, alarm, or resentment in others on the basis of race, color, creed, religion, or gender, commits disorderly conduct. Disorderly conduct, that's a misdemeanor. It's not a felony. But St. Paul puts what we would call a hate speech code on the books. And this is the ordinance uh, in, under, through which, under which, my preposition, RAV is charged. So let me tell you the facts of this case. Oh, let me first, uh, what is St. Paul's argument? The reason why St. Paul passed this ordinance and I think they did it in the late 80s. Victims are targeted not because of their individual attributes, but simply because they are members of a particular race, religion, or gender that has historically suffered discriminatory treatment. Uh, so that's their understanding of why this needs to happen. Because everybody knows in the United States that certain groups get targeted. And there's a second reason. Experts agree that by attacking a person's community, one interferes with that person's concept of self and individual growth and development. And there's a lot of social science at this point that would back up this idea of experts agree. Uh, if you know some of your Supreme Court history, Brown versus Board of Education, that uh, one of the arguments for why uh, segregated schools was unconstitutional was that it uh, affected the uh, feelings of self-esteem of black kids. And so the social science research was one of the reasons why Brown versus Board of Education was passed. So these are all reasonable arguments. And it seems somewhat akin to fighting words. So here's the case. Um, an uh, African-American family, Laura and Russell Jones, moves into a neighborhood in St. Paul, and they come out one morning, and there is a cross. And I want, it, this is from a video, so I'm sorry that the quality is not very good, but there's a, uh, the cross that the kids had put in their yard. There's three teenagers, three teenage boys, and they find it there. Um, to, you know, to threaten them. And here's the, the, again, it's from a video, not very good quality. Here's the kid who was charged. And um, so, because there is this ordinance, he was charged with violating the anti-bias ordinance. And um, what happens is juvenile court throws out the charge. So he goes to juvenile court. They throw out that particular charge. The Minnesota Supreme Court reinstates it. He says, no, you, you can't just throw out that charge. That's an important ordinance. St. Paul passed this ordinance, and you need to take it seriously. Uh, so when the Minnesota Supreme Court reinstates it, 
uh, RAV gets some lawyers and goes to the Supreme Court. And here's what they say. First Amendment forbids the government to regulate speech in ways that favor some viewpoints or ideas at the expense of others. There's nothing in the First Amendment that says speech towards specific groups should be treated differently than speech towards other groups. Regulations which suppress expressive conduct on the basis of viewpoint obscure our goal of a tolerant, pluralistic society. So they make a strong First Amendment case, and they also make a case that we got to have more tolerance here, or we're not going to have a First Amendment. So it goes to the Supreme Court, and that's who's on the Supreme Court in the 90s. I think the only one who's still there is Justice Thomas. Uh, I don't think Breyer is there, but if anybody sees Breyer, let me know. Um, but the decision comes down, and I, as I said, it was unanimous. There was no dissent. Do you know which way they went? With RAV or with St. Paul? What do you think? Anybody? Did they go with the teenager or did they go with the city? Curious. Anybody have want to hazard a guess? Yes. They went with the teenager, yes. Um, the Supreme Court backed the kid. The First Amendment does not permit St. Paul to impose special prohibitions on those speakers who express views on disfavored subjects. This has, and I'll give you a few more quotations from it, but this becomes understood as something called viewpoint discrimination. The law cannot discriminate on who can discriminate. And Scalia, who's always pretty great with the sentence, uh, I've pulled out a few that he has. One, the politicians of St. Paul are entitled to express hostility towards certain biases. So go ahead, St. Paul. Make a big case that cr burning crosses is a really bad idea. It has a terrible history. It's always used to uh, threaten and intimidate specific population, so go ahead, St. Paul, you can use your power to make this case. Uh, but not through the means of imposing unique limitations upon speakers who disagree. St. Paul has no such authority to license one side of a debate to fight freestyle while requiring the other to follow Marquis of Queensbury rules. So I don't know, I'm not a boxer, but that's what those Brits, those posh Brits would do. It's a, it's a highly regulated form of fighting. So one side can do freestyle, and the other side has to follow these very, very uh, constricted rules. And they didn't like that, that kind of discriminatory uh, effort. And here's my last quotation from Scalia. Let there be no mistake about our belief that burning a cross in someone's yard is reprehensible, no doubt about that. But St. Paul has sufficient means at its disposal to prevent such behavior without adding the First Amendment to the fire. So that's pretty much the law of the land. This case has not been thrown out. As it is, is that you cannot um, create laws that punish certain kinds of speech towards specific groups and um, would allow the same kind of speech about a different group. Now, it may feel strange to say this, and I'm in a public university right now, and uh, public universities, and I, and I saw coming in, like there's some uh, pledges for anti-racism and, and something of that sort to, to change the culture or to improve things on campus. I'm not against that whatsoever. Um, but it's when colleges or universities start to make very specific hate speech codes that they run into trouble. Um, it's not that they can't do it, it's just that they'll probably be sued. And at this stage, what I understand uh, is the, that there's been a lot of litigation against schools, public and private, who impose certain speech codes based on race, 
gender, sexual orientation, uh, and that uh, as of now, I gather there's been 365 suits, and all of those suits um, went in the direction of this decision. So this is really the law of the land. So in answer to the question, must hate speech endure, I'm sorry, must free speech endure hate speech? The Supreme Court says, yes, it must be endured. And um, when, you know, groups, uh, particularly nowadays, when um, there is a big racial reckoning in this country, there is a big effort to uh, try and improve uh, the conditions of African Americans, then a lot of activists are like, this is terrible, I hate the Constitution. Turns out college students are not so keen on the First Amendment. They do surveys every so often. Um, and over time, the First Amendment and free speech has become less uh, valued by college students. But one thing to keep in mind is that, and this is something I got from Emerson Sykes, who's an ACLU lawyer, uh, and who has this great YouTube video, First Amendment, Free Speech for Activists, I think is what it is. And he says, do remember, if you decide you wish to pass hate speech laws, you must remember who is going to enforce them. And you should put in your mind the attorney general you're least happy about. So if you love Mayor Garland, then you're going to say uh, speech codes are great because he's going to know exactly which ones to enforce. But if you don't like Merrick Garland, then you might be a little unhappy that he has that kind of power. Or if you feel like William Barr might not be so great for our country, that's the person you should imagine who's going to enforce it. So every time we give the state that kind of power, that's who gets to decide whether something constitutes hate speech or not. So that's one argument that uh, you can make in terms of thinking about it in terms of the law. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to believe we can change people's behavior by criminalizing speech. However, we want to make sure that really we want to give the state that kind of power. So the Supreme Court was not happy with that. But, um, it's not just the Supreme Court. So we have to figure out, if this is the law of the land, then what does it take to endure hate speech? And this is where I was thinking about um, several, and I, I'm getting rather nostalgic. I guess you can say I'm an old crank now, because I've started to become quite nostalgic for the 1970s. And I'll show you why. Um, so, and I'm going to give you two different approaches on what it looks like to endure hate speech. This one is a pretty high bar. I'm not sure I could handle it. This is um, John Lewis and other uh, people in Georgia, in Cairo, Georgia, and they went to a pool, public pool that did not allow blacks, and they engage in direct action at the pool. So um, they had a very, it's almost like boot camp for activists. If you were going to engage in direct action, there were three steps you had to do beforehand. The first one is you better go to this specific community and get specific examples of exactly what was happening that was against the Constitution. It may be fine for the local statutes, but they really held on to the Constitution. So if they saw something happening, like uh, freedom assembly being breached through white people can go to this pool but no black people can, uh, then they were going to find out specifically what those constitutional violations were. And then the second thing they did before they did this very brave step uh, is they went and negotiated. So they didn't just decide on their own, okay, this is a terrible thing that's happening at Cairo in the pool, and uh, we've seen all these violations, and we know that it's wrong, and we've checked in with our conscience, and we feel like it's, it's a bad thing. The second thing they do is they negotiate. They actually talk to the people in charge and try and make a case for letting uh, black people into the pool. 
And then the third thing they do, and this is the hardest, and this is uh, before they get public with their direct action. The third thing they do is it involves self-purification. That's the term that was used. And in self-purification, you practice enduring despicable acts happening to you. So you practice what it's like to be spat upon. You practice what it's like to have uh, cops coming at you. You practice what it's like to hear a lot of terrible things being said about you, screamed at you. You learn to endure. And um, that process, uh, Martin Luther King writes about it in Letter from Birmingham Jail. He says, one of the questions we ask is, will you endure jail? Will you endure the punishment you will receive? Can you really endure that? Because when you break the law, he wants us to break the law the bad laws, openly and lovingly, which means you take the consequences for this. And the question is, can you endure it? So they're doing boot camp to endure. Free speech, enduring hate speech. Uh, and here's another picture. Uh, this man is eating so he can spit on John Lewis. But John Lewis is not looking at that man. He's looking at what he's looking at, his sense of freedom. So as I say, that's a very high bar. But to me, it's an example, a very powerful example of how free speech endures hate speech. And the other, which is more fun, for me at least, because I don't know, could I do what John Lewis did? I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'd like to believe I could, but I think that would be very hard to be spat upon. This one is far more fun, but is another way to endure hate speech. So this is October 30th, 1961, Howard University, historically black college. On the far left, that's Bayard Rustin. Uh, Bayard Rustin was right-hand man to Martin Luther King and uh, helped organize the March on Washington. He studied uh, what Gandhi was doing with Satyagraha. He has a brilliant political theorist. Uh, if you haven't heard of Bayard Rustin, look him up. He's one of my favorites. And he uh, believed in civil rights. He believed in nonviolent direct action. He believed in organizing across racial lines for economic advancement. He, in, uh, so he was what we'd call nowadays a liberal and also an organizer. And for him, class was as important as race. In fact, there was uh, certain arguments he made around building class alliance which puts them far more in a more socialist camp than purely on race. Malcolm X, who's in the middle, very different idea. Malcolm X thought Bayard Rustin was an idiot. Bayard Rustin thought Malcolm X was delusional. And they talked about each other on stage in these ways. Uh, so How Howard University was very happy to have Bayard Rustin come and speak, because he was part of Martin Luther King's very respectable powerful movement. Malcolm X, Howard University is not so sure. Do we really want this guy coming? He's going to talk about the blue-eyed devil. He's going to say, we don't want, um, we don't, it's not that we want segregation, it's that we want separation. Because we've learned enough about white people, and we've learned enough about Christianity, and we've learned enough, and Christianity is the white man's God, is white man's religion. And we've learned enough about the America, this great thing, that we don't trust it. So here are two oppositional figures. They love to debate. They sat in front of full houses on the same stage. They risk making their argument knowing that that person over there is rolling their eyes. And they're each calling each other that their, that their analysis they share. They share the analysis that the problem of black people in America is serious and bad, and something needs to be done about it. So they do share uh, some uh, idea of the problem. But their solutions are radically different. And they say it in front of each other. They say, you don't have a program, brother. It's, you, what are you going to do? You, you think Nation of Islam is going to solve all these problems? You're crazy. And then Malcolm X would say to Bayard Rustin, you've sold out to the man. You're, you're doing what the white man wants you to do. They're really hard on each other. It's offensive. The audience is listening. 
the audience is like, oh my gosh, which one do I believe? And maybe, you know, this is like a, a speaker is trusting their audience to be able to hear competing ideas and not have their heads explode. And maybe even come up with a third way. That's enormous trust in the audience. They did it all the time, these two. Uh, that's one, their first one, 1961 at Howard University. They were at a church in Manhattan. Uh, other people in the uh, civil rights movement saw how much fun this was. Malcolm X was a great debater. He learned to debate in prison at, at the other higher ed education uh, in the Cambridge area. He said, I didn't go to Harvard. I went to this correctional facility. But I got a very good education there in prison. He learned how to debate, and he learned about the Nation of Islam. So other people, uh, James Foreman, also debated Malcolm X. This was a thing. People would go out and listen to groups who had strong, you know, sometimes it's the intimate enemy who's the hardest to hear their uh, disagreement. Because it's one thing to have somebody so far away from you disagree, but they took this on the road, and everybody loved it. So that to me is like, how do you endure? You become very smart with your words. And here's another one. And so this is my last slide. Uh, this is a hard picture to see, but what it is, there's Huey Newton, head of the Black Panther Party. This is 1973. William F. Buckley, you, can, you can't see him that well over there. Uh, he's a white man and pretty much the head of the conservative party in America post-war. And he had this show called Firing Line. And he brought on not just Huey Newton, uh, Muhammad Ali, Jesse Jackson, leaders in the black movement. And um, this one in particular you can find on YouTube. And it's amazing because Huey Newton's a live wire. He gets in on this stage, and they're sitting down, and Huey Newton is smoking, and William Buckley is not smoking, but he's leaning back, and he explains to his audience, this is Huey Newton, uh, he's alleged to have killed the police officer, he was tried three times, the jury couldn't convict him, he was let out. You know, he doesn't say, this is Huey Newton, the cop killer, but that's kind of the undertone. So that's how he sets the stage. And then Huey Newton, before the interview begins, he says, ah, I got a question for you. My friend, he wants me to ask you. And Buckley stops, because you knew Buckley was about to ask him a whole bunch of questions about the Black Panthers, and was this going to be a good program or not, and, and why is armed rebellion or armed resistance ever a good idea for a minority group? So you can tell he's going to go somewhere, and Huey Newton cuts him off, and he says, would you have been on George Washington's side in the revolution, or the other George? And Buckley's like, whoa. And he's thinking, I have to think about this. I'm not sure. As revolutions go, it was pretty humane. But maybe there was a better way to, to solve this. I don't know. I guess I want to say I would have been with George Washington. And that's all Huey Newton needs. And he starts smiling and saying, you know, you're not such a bad guy after all. And then they go on this wild, I mean, it's a wild discussion. But here's the piece that I want to say, is each endured the other in a very creative way. And uh, so if you don't feel, and I certainly don't feel like I'm up to the level of endurance of a John Lewis, that this is another way to think about enduring. It's building muscles. It's getting strong. And so I've put here just a few suggestions on how to endure hate speech. And this is, if you've done a public speaking class, this is like standard uh, ways to get attention. Because always when you're giving a speech, you want to be able to get people's attention. So uh, refer to the occasion. I mentioned, oh, isn't it lovely? We're in this hall. Uh, use a personal reference. Ask a rhetorical question. That's what Huey Newton did. He asked this wild question. And then make a startling statement of fact or opinion. He really aced it. From, because that's how Huey Newton started this interview, the, all the dynamics change. And uh, there's other options. You can use a quotation if you don't want to be as startling as Huey Newton, tell a joke, or use an illustration. All of these things, if you're in a difficult encounter with somebody, and you feel like they're wanting to just knock you off at the kneecaps, rhetorically speaking, 
this is a good way to just change the vibe. So that's what I want, I've sort of come to. Yes, the law is pretty clear. We must endure hate speech. But enduring doesn't have to just mean this, or running away, or getting scared. I think that's one of the things uh, I wish to see more of in the 21st century, is modeling ways to actually endure as opposed to criminalize. So that's, that's, my, that's my spiel. Um, but I'd love to know what you guys are thinking. So let me just do a, a time check here. Because um, I know they want to show a movie. Oh yeah, we have a, we have some time. So uh, out of curiosity, any any thoughts on this notion of uh, that free speech does need to endure hate speech? And I love a disagreement, so feel free to to disagree. And I know people are. Do we do we have a way of knowing if people are? are asking questions who are streaming in? OK, yeah, so if you're out there in the ether and you have any questions or pushback, really very happy to, uh, to hear any disagreement or dissent, uh, feel free to do that. Anybody here in the audience? I know it's hard because it's very dark and I'm very bright up here. Yeah, George. Yeah. Great, thank you, George. So the. Uh, Yeah, oh, thank you. OK, so uh, my friend uh, George Putnam has asked about whether, uh, about my background with debate and how debate is working. Um, I often use debate in the classroom, and um, especially about very controversial issues. Uh, this semester, the first debate coming out of the gates, and we were studying the abolitionists, and the debate topic was, this house believes that the Constitution supports white supremacy. And the students had done some reading in the abolitionists, and they could find arguments there in support of the proposition, the affirmative. And then uh, there had also been other readings of the abolitionists, and so they could find textual support there. So students have to do some thinking, like what is a really good argument for the affirmative, and what is a very good argument for the negative, so that you can think through what might be coming. They don't know which side they're going to debate until I do a coin toss. Uh, in some debate circles, you do it right before the debate, but I found it's better to at least give people 48 hours to know what side they're on. Uh, but it starts to build the, the, the muscles to, first of all, when you make a claim, you have to give a reason for your claim. You have to find some evidence to support your claim. And you should be anticipating that your opponent may have some counter evidence. So just getting the brain to work in this way, I found is, um, I don't know, I think people start to feel like this is fun. I didn't know I could let my brain consider my opponent's point of view. And that in fact, I would feel satisfied to hear a very strong argument coming at me, just as like when you're playing tennis, if you can get a good partner, it feels much more energetic. So I've been interested in the fact that, uh, at least in the aughts, starting in the like 2004, 2005, there seemed to be a real resistance on college campuses, at least here in Vermont, around debate. I'm hoping that's going to change. I'm starting to see signs. There was something in the Washington Post today about um, trying to get more civil disagreements going. I think debate is a good way to do that. So, yeah. Any other?
other questions or nothing coming in? Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, does anybody want to push back on this around hate speech? That maybe there should be more laws out there? I mean, hate speech is pretty terrible. Um, something, another statistic that um, has been getting a lot of airplay is how on college campuses, students are feeling less free to speak. It's nothing about what the laws are saying. And it's nothing about um, what they've been told they can and cannot say, although that's always an element of it. But there does seem to be an interesting shift going on right now, which is probably why I keep doing this. Anybody ask me to come talk about free speech, I'm eager to do it and to show ways that it can be fun because we also seem to have a problem of self-censorship. And um, so I guess I want to just, I'm not, I'm not going to diagnose and say that's why people don't want to talk about this topic, but it is a hard topic to talk about. Uh, yeah, so Allison is asking, how do you understand where speech makes, turns into action? You mean like a burning cross or? Right, right. Uh, yeah, so it's, what Allison is asking is like certain words may be understood as causing uh, harm. So just to say them is harm. Uh, and that's one of those gray areas because fighting words doctrine, that's still the law. So if you say something and immediately you're gonna assume there's gonna be harm. I mean, all that Mr. Chaplinsky was saying is he was calling his neighbors fascist. And he was calling the town of Rochester, the city, fascist. And that, the court said, was constituted fighting words and therefore was not protected speech. So I, you know, that's a gray area. I don't want to make it sound as if something could be fighting words, because fighting words is always out there. When it becomes directed at a specific group, then it's harder to call it fighting words. And I don't know, maybe this makes no sense. And when I think about it long and hard, uh, all he said was fascist. You guys are fascist. But during a war, it was understood if you call the city fascist and the country is fighting fascism, that there's going to be a revolt. So that's, that law still stands. If there's going to be a, a bit, it's like calling, uh, what is it, fire in a crowded theater, that that would be a problem. Time, place, and manner. So. It becomes a legal question. I don't know if there's any lawyers in here who want to uh, take up this, this question, but trying to figure out when speech becomes fighting words, I'm not so sure. Coming up with a code that says you can't say nasty things about a specific group of people, that one, so far, you can't make that kind of a law. Yeah. Okay, I have one last little story. And um, well, then we can wrap it up for 1984. Uh, and that is oftentimes people um, get sort of frustrated. Like, this is terrible. Why can't we put a law on the book when something is so clearly attacking either black people or LGBTQ people or uh, Jews? Those are the three categories. That oftentimes there's this understanding, like, why can't we just put those laws on the book and then, then we make life better for everybody else. So having one of the things I do besides teach is I work with, uh, through the community justice centers with people who spend time in the Vermont correctional system. And um, 
the Vermont Correctional System, I'm, uh, you know, I have many good things to say about it. It's not an inhumane place. And a lot of the guys I work with, they were like, wow, I had the best Thanksgiving dinner in there. So I, I don't want to make it sound like it's a terrible, terrible place. But it's not the sort of place where you go and become less racist or less sexist or less homophobic or transphobic. There's just something about life and corrections. In fact, racial categories tend to get reinforced. So when I hear from people, what you're saying, Meg, is just terrible. We really need, I mean, you should hear what that guy said. Why is he still allowed to walk the streets of Montpelier? Then I think, well, what's he going to be like when he gets out of corrections, out of Southern, or one of the other facilities? You think he's going to be a nicer guy? And that's where we get into that whole thing about compulsion, compulsion and force. Sometimes my dear friends on the left, I think, make a mistake because they wish to compel people to think a certain way. But that's not the way to American unity, to go back to that justice. But the only way we can go back to American unity is to be using persuasion. Some of these techniques, rhetorical techniques, ways to try and make a connection, try to move someone from where they are to where you'd like them to be, knowing that they may not. But you got to meet them where they are. I don't think crime, criminalization, sending people to corrections makes them nicer people. So that's my closing remarks. And with that, I'll say thank you very much again for coming out.